Hello, everybody, and welcome. Welcome to the industry chat today. Uh, we're just going to allow a couple seconds to, uh, you know, let folks continue to uh, enter the chat or enter enter into the, the webinar. Um, and uh, hey, feel free to get a look at our starting slide and get inspired and motivated for a chat today. I know I'm excited. How are, how are you doing, Isaac? Doing good. Excited to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Awesome. That is great. All right. Well, so let's go ahead and get started. Uh, my name is Jenna Quinn, and it's my pleasure as the Assistant Director of Alumni and Infinity Engagement to welcome you all to this 49er Industry Chat. Um, a couple of housekeeping items. We just need to inform everyone that this session is being recorded. And so what that really means for you is that this will be available for you on demand at our website, www.csuob.edu slash alumni. Feel free to watch it again or share it with a friend or anyone you think might get something out of the chat today. Um, and since this is a webinar format, if you're here with us today live, uh, we encourage you all to use the Q&A box at the bottom of your screen to submit your questions for our guest speaker. Uh, and we'll make sure those get, get relayed on over to him. Uh, and with that, it's my pleasure to introduce Isaac Bermudez. Hi, Isaac. Hi. Hello. Hi, everybody. <laughs> Hi again. Let me just uh, read, your, read your bio so folks can kind of get a sense of you know, who you are and, and, and what you're doing here. Um, so Isaac has been uh, providing services in applied behavior analysis, ABA, since 1998. He's worked in executive leadership positions in, behave, in the behavioral health industry for the last 15 years and uses the principle of organizational behavior management to guide and support, uh, guide the support and growth of organizations. Over the past 15 years, Isaac has led ABA departments, started companies, and has grown organizations over 500% while earning awards for quality of service and employee satisfaction. In addition to Isaac's primary role at BDA, uh, he, is, uh, he is an invited speaker for state and national conferences, as well as a co-author of articles and chapters, most recently, the textbook on multi multiculturalism and applied behavior analysis. Uh, Isaac is a co-founder of the Latino Association for Behavioral Behavior Analysis, uh, as well as uh, the mentorship program called, uh, and I'm gonna, I'm gonna mess this one up, Isaac. I think it's a mentorologist. Correct. Ah, yeah. Okay. You, got it. you nailed it. <laughs> <laughs> which has dedicated, which has a dedicated YouTube channel that bears the same name. Uh, finally, Isaac is developing a performance management app called Smash My Goal that will be available in early 2024 on iOS and Android. Uh, family is everything to Isaac, who is a proud husband and father. Wow, I there's just so much there. I don't know how we're gonna. A bit of a mouthful. I, <laughs> I apologize. <laughs> I don't know how we're going to pack this into 45 minutes. So I think the best thing is to kind of just get started. So um, if you don't mind, if we could start off with a little bit of background about yourself, if you can share a little bit about your, your experiences that kind of led you to pursue a degree at the beach. Yeah, uh, I'd be happy to. Uh, and um, I, I think where I'd like to start off with that question um, is uh, just early on in my childhood, and I, I promise I won't go through all the all the different steps, but um, I, the earliest that I remember really having thoughts about career and so forth was around middle school where it really resonated to me that I wanted to help others. Um, I didn't know what that meant, but I just wanted to help others. That was a pull, a calling that I had that has persisted uh, in my life and in my career from that point to where we are now. Um, I also, I grew up in Orange County uh, so not too far away from Cal State Long Beach and, you know, was the son of two immigrants who uh, didn't have a college education, um, but they really valued education itself. So, uh, you know, they sacrificed and did their best to send me to uh, Catholic schools and so forth um, and really instilled in me the um, the value of pursuing an education and preparing myself. So 
uh, those values really, uh, really stayed with me. And after high school, I uh, went to a community college uh, where I did my GEs. Um, and around that time, and I don't know why, but I had my mindset on, I wanted to go to Cal State Long Beach. That was my singular focus. So I used the community college experience to prepare myself to make that transfer and that transition. Um, and with the the calling that I have to ha had to help others, uh, I explored different majors. I wanted to be a physical therapy major. That didn't really work out. Um, I then landed on a social work major. And when I ended up transferring, uh, I still remember because it, it was a panic, right? Um, uh, one of the things uh, with not having a lot of family members that went to college, I, I felt uh, kind of lost and had to figure things out for myself, which was very scary for me uh, in that transition. And I remember transferring to Cal State Long Beach uh, as a social work major and uh, going to the department and enrolling in uh, the program uh, to find out that the program that I wanted to roll, enroll in, which was the child and family side of things, uh, was impacted and was not accepting new students. So the panic, I, and I still, it's bringing back those uh, <laughs> those feelings again. Um, I, I didn't know what to do. I, the, the only other program um, I wasn't necessarily interested in. So I, I remember, um, and I now, now it's all coming back because we used to register on the phone and all of that. I remember being on campus and trying to figure out what class I was going to register for. So I had to make a one of my a quick pivot during that time and say, if it's not going to be social work, what else can I do? Um, and again, uh, the the value that I had of trying to help others never wavered. It was just how I was going to do that. Um, so, uh, you know, I, I could say um, my career has been has been really wrapped into a variety of divine interventions. Um, during that time, I I remember really enjoying psychology, and like it was at that point that I made a switch to becoming a psychology major, and I'm very grateful for those circumstances that happened because uh, I ended up joining the psychology department, uh, going through that major and graduating Cal State Long Beach as a psychology major. And that kind of flung me into, you know, what I do now. So um, that 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 was my, what I remember of my college experience. And, you know, it was just um, a whirlwind, but, you know, I couldn't be more grateful for all of the circumstances, circumstances that happened because, you know, those were the things that led to where I am now. Yeah, for sure. I, I mean, I think that that's something that students, many students, you know, a challenge many students face, right? Not necessarily knowing exactly what it is or having other cir external circumstances that, you know, come come through that's like, okay, well, I guess I can't do that. So it's an important skill to pivot, right? Indeed. Yeah, for Super sure. Super important. So, I mean, when you were at CSULB, what was that student experience like? Were you in any clubs? Did you have any um, peer groups or professors that were important? Yeah, uh, that's a great question. So, so you know, um, again, um, and and this is was probably part of the inspiration of my title for for this talk. Um, uh, so, one of the things that I experienced, uh, which I'm very grateful for now, but it was very uh, stressful during the time, is um, we didn't. I didn't come from a background where I had the means to pay for college and all of that. So I, I really had to figure it out on top of learning how to pivot. It was just learning how to problem solve to be able to fulfill the goals that I had. And one of those was how to pay for college. Uh, so my college experience, um, I was working full time. I commuted to school. I um, So I, I didn't have necessarily the time to join clubs and all of that, which I wish I would have had. I, you know, it's something that that was missing in my college experience. But um, what I do remember fondly is um, because I commuted, I would just try to make the best out of the time that I was on campus. So I, I would go to classes. I would then in between classes, if I had long gaps, I would either hang out at the student union or at the library and I would study. I would just try to uh, just be there and, you know, take advantage of the campus life, uh, although it wasn't within any organize, organized club or activities. Uh, and then, you know, I would do the, my work thing and stuff. Um, but, you know, I, I think fondly, and I still remember uh, just being there on campus, uh, taking advantage of the library system, um, you know, being able to uh, just uh, have quiet spaces to uh, do my work and all of that. And, 
you know, I, I have a love for being on college campuses. Uh, it's something that people that are close to me, they know that uh, I'm obsessed to visiting college campuses when I travel and things. It's just something that I love. And I, I think it was born out of just uh, hanging out at Cal State Long Beach and just being part of that environment. Um, it just, it breeds, uh, you know, studying and and just being educational and just being academic. Um, so it's something that that's near and dear to my heart. Um, but, you know, I think uh, that, that's what I remember of, of the experience that I have you know, that I had in school. Yeah. No, I totally know what you mean. There's just that energy, that electricity that just sparks, uh, you know, sparks inspiration and 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 innovation and, and tying it back to the title of your chat. Um, I, I loved it. I mean, from underdog to entrepreneur, I feel like that's not a, a term you hear very often. I mean, would you, would you explain what that means to you? Sure. Um, yeah, happy to. So, um, you know, I, I think a, a more common word is entrepreneur. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I've had the, ha the chance to experience that where um, it was in 2009. Uh, I'd been in my profession for a while, about 10 years, and um, I had the itch to open up my own practice. Uh, so um, I took the leap into entrepreneurship and it was uh, another uh, scary leap, uh, something that I wasn't prepared for, but it was something that I was able to, with a partner, build a successful practice. Um, but there were there were things about it that didn't work out. Uh, and um, I was there for three years. I ended up uh, selling my portion of it. My partner remained and he kept on with the company, but I was able to learn a lot. It was uh, kind of going to the school of hard knocks on that one, um, just to learn all the aspects of opening up a business, uh, the startup, the, uh, you know, securing funding and so forth. Um, and what I, what I pulled from that experience is, you know, the entrepreneur, entrepreneurial behaviors and skills that you could use in any position. Um, you know, sometimes we glamorize being an entrepreneur, uh, but, you know, it's, um, it's a lot of hard work and it's a lot of risk taking and not everybody is wired the way an entrepreneur is. Um, and I tell all the entrepreneurs that I work with, uh, that you are all wired in a very different way. Uh, but even if I don't have some of those wirings, um, the entrepreneurial spirit and the behaviors that one engages in can be utilized within a company. And I still felt like I had that that in me, the the uh, part some part risk taking, being creative. So um, in my my latest venture, I actually uh, teamed up with an organization based out of New Jersey called Brett Denovian Associates. And um, they wanted to open up a branch here in California. So uh, that that became the entrepreneurial part of it, which entrepreneurial stands for being entrepreneurial and engaging in those behaviors and activities within an organization. Um, so if you're looking for a definition, um, and and I set out to do that. I opened up a practice again um, from scratch uh, and... Um, with with the security of having an organization that was stable uh, to really back me and support me, um, so it was a a less scary venture, but still uh, required the risk taking and all of that. Um, I assembled a team. You know, we opened up, um, you know, we opened up some contracts with with funding sources, and we started providing work. Um, so all of that was very entre entrepreneurial, um, and you know, and along the way, um, you know, I founded different projects for the company to address company needs. Um, one of those being mentorologists, you know, there's uh, just, and there still is an extreme need in our field in applied behavior analysis uh, with the uh, growth uh, in the last five years. Um, we have a lot of young professionals. Um, there's just a huge need for mentorship. So I opened up a uh, project called Mentorologist to offer mentorship to young professionals in our field. Um, and that began around uh, the end of 2019. Um, so we were just meeting in person, offering free mentorship. I was networking and connecting with the community, offering that service. Uh, so again, when you talk about entrepreneurship, it's creating something to fill a need um, within an organization. Um, COVID came and we had to pivot to uh, to this type of format. So uh, it still remains, um, but the creativity part in it, you know, has led me to, um, to uh, not only offer webinars now that reach all over the country, um, 
but also, you know, we've partnered up in doing conferences. Uh, the last one was in early 2023, this year, early this year in Fort Lauderdale, uh, where we partnered up and we did a conference uh, there through uh, the mentor mentorologist uh, program. And, um, and we just started uh, offering and opening up a YouTube channel to offer free mentorship content for those professionals in our field. Uh, but essentially, it could also be for any field because it's about just mentorship and performance management and getting the best out of ourselves and others. Um, so again, uh, that I consider those things entrepreneurship. Um, along the way, um, if, if you'll notice, uh, one of my biggest passions in life is mentoring others, which I think aligns with uh, the mission that I've read about this program as well. Um, Smash My Goal is an app that I've been working on for about a year, year and a half. Um, and that's uh, aimed at supporting people to level up and trend up in their goals. Um, so that's something that I'm really excited about because it's at the heart of what I'm all about. Um, and it supports people to keep on growing and performing at their best by uh, self-monitoring their goals, reporting out to a mentor and all the things that go into goal tracking and stuff like that. So, um, so that's my entrepreneurial story and a little bit about what that is. Yeah, that's incredible. But I think, I think, you know, I really want to take a step back and kind of like, clearly you're doing so much, but what, what, how did you know that it was applied behavioral analysis that you wanted to go into in the first place? What was that? What was your journey like into that field? Was it an intentional one or was it something that, you know, you fell into after school? What, what did that look like for you? Yeah, um, that's, that's an interesting question uh completely fell it fell into it um so I I I remember as I was uh, set to graduate from Cal State Long Beach I was working at Disneyland and that's what got me through school but Disneyland was not my profession and I wanted to again help others and I wanted to get into my field so um uh so I think as uh right before I, I was about to graduate, I pretty sure I went to the career center and you know did the activities of looking for uh positions that were available. Um and I identified all the ones that stood out to me that revolved around helping others. Um, and I just sprayed my resume out uh to see uh if I it would land anywhere uh where I could be of help. Uh and shortly after, uh, I would say a few months after graduating, a company called me uh and they had a position. So I went and um, and it ended up being a company that provided, uh, it was an, a, an adult day program for individuals and adults with developmental disabilities. Uh, part, part of my pull, I always saw myself as wanting to work with, you know, individuals with severe needs, challenges, and be able to be of support with those individuals. And I remember driving to that first interview, uh, freshly graduated with this degree, not sure what I was going to do with it. And I remember driving and seeing, you know, individuals that were physically challenged, uh, behaviorally challenged, cognitively challenged. And I remember getting excited because I felt like this is what I went to school for. And this is what, you know, I feel like I'm going to get closer to what I really wanted to do. Um, so I interviewed, I got the position and that's how I kind of stumbled into applied behavior analysis, uh, because that particular program, uh, had a behavioral approach, uh, you know, they utilized a lot of the principles and concepts of applied behavior analysis. Uh, and that's where I was able to really get a real life application of the science. Because up until then, um, you know, I, I always share that when I was at school, uh, the one class that I took was, the, I, I think it was um, a learning class. And that was one of my least favorite psychology classes. Um, I So it's interesting that now as a profession, I actually do that. But uh, the application part of it really, uh, really gelled together what I what I learned there, and it it made more sense. So what ended up what was uh, my least favorite class ended up being my career. So uh, it's just interesting how things happen. But you know, I I totally fell into it, and I fell in love with applied behavior analysis then. Um, so uh, soon after that, you know, I I my calling was really working with children. So you know, I changed companies and. I uh, started working with kids doing applied behavior analysis in schools and homes, um, really specializing in working with children with autism. Um, so I did that for about four years. I, I got close to getting burned out and leaving the field. Um, and again, you know, with another divine intervention moment, um, 
as I was in my last interview for the probation department and I was going to leave applied behavior analysis, um, I got a call the day before my last interview and I got an opportunity to become a supervisor. Um, and that really intrigued me. So I took a turn and I, I took that position. I didn't go to the last interview and that's what sealed my love for applied behavior analysis. And that's when I chose uh, and made the decision to go back to graduate school to really um, focus on making applied behavior analysis my career. I went to Cal State LA, which was at the time one of the only um, brick and mortar programs that offered an applied behavior analysis program um, here in, in Southern California. So uh, I did that and uh, became a board certified behavior analyst in 2005. Um, and now have been doing this for 25 years. Uh, this year was my 25th year doing applied behavior analysis. So yeah, that's that's me stumbling into it and just landing into something that I couldn't imagine doing anything else. I, I, I completely love what I do. Yeah, no, I mean, stumbling into it, but then running with it, right? Um, but I think, uh, you know, something that's that people really do want to know or, or, or folks mm -hmm. want to know when they're, um, like considering careers is, you know, what's the day to day look like someone working in applied behavioral analysis? What is, what does a day look like a typical day? Yeah. So, uh, so that looks different depending on the level of position that you're in, uh, for our behavior tech positions, uh, they, uh, they typically get a caseload. So depending on what they, the clients that they get assigned to, uh, it could be either working in a school, um, a public school, providing uh, behavior support for students with uh, behavior issues or some type of uh, special needs. And they they go to a school, they, they shadow the students, uh, work with the teacher, work in a classroom, implement the behavior intervention plan for the student to prevent problem behavior. Or if behavior escalations happen, they you know implement some crisis plan and things to kind of keep the student uh, calm and learning and so forth. Um, so that's kind of a full day in school for those staff that work in schools. They might then go from there to a home program and they do a, let's say a two hour session implementing the uh, behavioral program for a child in their home. Um, or, or if they have all home programs, they might be traveling to about three clients in a day uh, doing two hour sessions from home program to home program um, to accumulate their hours and their schedule. So that's at the tech level. Uh, a supervisor or BCBA, for those that aspire to uh, become a uh, become board certified, uh, they would have a, a caseload and travel around to supervise and oversee the cases that are under their caseload. Uh, so they might go into a school and see how their students doing, um, support and mentor their technician to uh, fine tune the plan or problem solve things that aren't working out. And then they might travel to another staff and student. They might take meetings. They uh, will be writing reports. Um, so there's a mixture of the clinical work and the clinical oversight, as well as the administrative part of summarizing progress, analyzing data, and so forth. Um, and then at the executive level, uh, we support more systems in terms of, you know, um, how a program is working and they lead a program uh, for either like early intervention or uh, the behavior health side of it or our school program. Uh, and they're uh, putting systems in place to make it easier for our staff to uh, work. They uh, support the leadership on um, any issues that are going on or how to keep things thriving and so forth. Um, uh, and then, and then what I do, I, I spend a lot of my time, I'm, you know, in, uh, in meetings, uh, providing executive coaching, providing mentorship to our leaders, um, supporting their growth and their professional development. Um, you know, there's the financial part of it, of making sure that our company stays sustainable and we keep our lights on and we keep growing. Um, but a lot of it uh, is a lot of mentorship is just uh, working with all of our team. I just um, uh, left a meeting with uh, one of my, one of my managers uh, and we were coaching and, you know, supporting him to, uh, you know, help support the growth of his department and so forth. Um, so my weeks are recurring um, mentorship meetings with my executive team, um, uh, along with, you know, some paperwork that goes along with it and any other administrative stuff. But yeah, those, those are different layers of what work looks like. Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, it, it almost seems like there's, there's a clear ladder uh, of just different you know, a, a journey on this, on this particular path. Yeah. Uh, yeah, there, there is, it's, it's pretty defined, especially with 
our field requiring certain certifications to do a certain type of job. Um, you know, to be able to go from a tech to a supervisor, one either needs a master's degree or a board certified or becoming a board certified behavior analyst. Uh, and then after that it becomes, you know, just uh, the experience and the, um, the performing what performance one has to, uh, to be able to do executive type work. Um, you know, I, I know at our company, we really, really pride our, ourselves and one of our values for the company is to find people's niches. So um, I, I don't like to make the latter too uh, linear because I also think uh, people, our staff are motivated by being able to have unique opportunities to uh, do different things. So uh, we take a look at our staff's passions and see if we could use that uh, in the company. Um, and we've been able to do that with uh, any of our staff that have a real defined passion. Uh, you know, like for instance, we have a staff that loves music. So he created a music program for our clients and he kind of created his own niche within music. Um, and we have, you know, different things to offer all of our staff the opportunity to keep on moving up. So it's not just only one way, there's a variety of different ways to grow. Yeah. You know, so in, in the field in general and, and also for you yourself, um, you know, how is the work-life balance sort of blend? I know that when, you, when you're working with folks who have, you know, um, different struggles, right? Like it, it's very easy to, I mean, you said it yourself, you're kind of getting burnt out. Um, so what is that, what is that battle like with work-life balance and, and any advice for what you found works for you? Yeah, well, I, you know, I think, uh, work-life balance can be a struggle in our field because so much is asked of us at any level, um, emotionally, physically, time-wise, and typically those that are drawn to this profession are natural givers and, you know, they, uh, they have a passion for, helping others. So it's very easy for somebody to get caught up in overgiving to the point where they easily get burned out and they have nothing else to give. It's like the whole um, oxygen mask analogy of an airplane. Um, so so I, so I think um, being aware of one's capacity is something that's really important because the field will want from you more than what you could physically give. So one has to be very intentional with being aware of what is my max and just making sure that that you don't exceed it. So uh, being able to know one's limitations and know when to say no, know when um, to set limits, uh, know when to communicate, like I'm getting to my max, like what do I do type of thing and getting that type of coaching and support is gonna be really important. Uh, and everybody's different. Everybody has a different capacity. Um, so on top of that, I would say the, the flip side of it is I think a good skill and something to be aware of is how can one expand their capacity and their ability to endure and persevere uh, because um, that will allow them to handle higher stress and higher volume type of work at a higher level. Um, one has to have, you know, a pretty big capacity to be able to handle, um, you know, the management responsibilities that one gets when they get to that point. So I think one is being aware and being, uh, being good about having limits and boundaries, but also while working on how can I expand my bandwidth, you know, and my ability to endure to be able to, in the future, uh, handle a higher volume work or maybe something that's more stressful. Um, and so we're not so brittle, you know, with the moments that that come our way. So I think both things um, I would say are important. And, um, and the idea of self-care is also something that's really critical um, in the work that we do, uh, because you know, our work for, at all levels is stressful. You know, we're dealing with uh, with individuals with needs and we're dealing with situations where we're in the middle of, you know, phys physically aggressive behavior or any type of, uh, of other behavior that we're dealing with. Um, so the idea of self-care and not taking things personally and stuff is gonna be really important to be able to do this day in and day out. Uh, or else uh, if any of those things are off, uh, the... Um, people easily get burned out. So um, as a leadership team, we try to be as sensitive and as aware of um, the burnout factor or any uh, mental health issues that come with doing this type of work and just offer staff support. Um, sometimes you have to save them from themselves because they want to do more than what they could do. And we're like, well, you don't have to do that much. Keep scale back. Um, uh, and so we have to just be really aware and set a culture and an environment where 
um, you know, it's important for people to engage in self-care and to take care of themselves, to be able to give to others. So, you know, we have very um, distinct values around that. Yeah. Um, you know, I think though, right after, right after that, you know, I think it's important to kind of highlight, you know, what makes the job so special, right? So, you know, what do you think is the most rewarding part of your job? And also what do you think is the most challenging part of your job? Yeah. Um, well, so I, I think at all levels, uh, the most rewarding part is to see people, individuals make progress. Um, you know, I remember when I worked as a technician, when your hard work with a client would um, a, would support them in saying their first words, being able to interact more effectively with their parents, uh, being able to access school, being able to uh, graduate school and being able to support them to achieve really big developmental and life milestones uh, was an intoxicating feeling to be able to see that that you were a little part in in their lives that not only changed their lives forever, but also uh, changed their family's lives too, because it, you know these uh, challenges cause a lot of family stress and parental stress. Um, so knowing that uh, you had a hand in supporting them in reaching very critical milestones um, is really, really rewarding. Um, at the at the leadership level, I, I actually I, I feel the same about supporting staff to grow and achieve their own professional milestones. I always say, um, you know, if I could if I could really coach and mentor a staff that works with four children and the more staff I'm able to support, the impact that I'm able to make to those individual clients is going to be bigger. So um, being able to see uh, our staff grow and, you know, develop, uh, reach their own milestones professionally um, is equally rewarding to me. Um, so I, I just, to me, uh, the idea of being able to support people to grow and go beyond, you know, their limits and capacities um, you know, is something that's super rewarding. And it, to me, to be able to see those that I've been able to support and who are now, um, you know, really making significant impacts in their profession. Um, and to know that, you know, you might have had a little bit of part in that through the mentorship and coaching uh, is everything for me. I mean, that's that's why I do what I do. Yeah. Um. So, I mean, I know that I've, you've already talked about how important mentorship is. And um, so I feel like what I what I really want to ask you is, you know, how do you have a successful mentorship? What does a successful mentorship relationship look like in your field? How do you find those mentors? And have you had any mentors um, that were particularly impactful for you? Sure. Uh, great question. That's 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 a whole hour conversation. At least, but <laughs> but I'll, I'll try to make it make it condensed. Um, so uh, I, I, I always share that a really successful mentorship relationship is like an intimate relationship where when you get into onto this path with a mentor, uh, because mentorship t tends to be more long lasting than some of the other leadership relationships like supervision, coaching. So mentorship, you're in it for the long haul. Uh, you know, so you, uh, you go through the ups and downs with your, with your mentor and you, um, you, you, develop a very trusting relationship and you lean on your mentor for a lot of things and so forth. Um, so, uh, so it's important to go all in and, you know, find people that you trust that could really support your career growth and can guide you along the way to the many stops that your career takes. Um, so, you know, I found my, my biggest success in finding mentors was just by networking and by putting myself in in situations where I would be able to meet people uh, that uh, that uh, could potentially be a mentor. And, you know, what I found is uh, by setting setting the occasion for meeting potential mentors, um, and this could be through conferences, through going to trainings, workshops, you know, and talking to people that have um, a higher understanding of something than you, um, you know, or emailing people and saying, hey, I really like the way you... Uh, you present it on this, uh, you know, uh, a lot of times you'll find that that mentors may open a door and they'll invite you to uh, be part of something. And what I found is there are people that 
for whatever reason, won't walk through that door because it's like, oh, I'm too busy. I'm this and that. Or there are people that will just walk through the door and trust that they'll be able to, to uh, be successful, right? Um, and and that's to me is the start of a mentorship journey is um, is finding somebody that you feel can offer you uh, benefit and offer you mentorship um, and just being very in tune with when they open up an opportunity or or open up a door, walk through it and you know develop that relationship, um, you know, because oftentimes we, uh, we don't, and we, uh, for whatever reason, we have a block and don't, you know, take advantage of an opportunity that's offered. Um, and, and then just like in any, any relationship, you have to work at, you know, at keeping that relationship thriving, because if you stop engaging in that relationship, um, then that mentorship relationship uh, goes away. So I think the mentee has also a lot of responsibility of, of staying, on top of, you know, that relationship and checking in on the mentor. Hey, how you doing? You know, how's everything going? Um, also, you know, following through with if uh, if they're working on projects or if there's stuff that is going on, just making sure that there's good follow through and all of that to keep that relationship thriving. Because as soon as it stops, then, you know, the mentorship relationship goes away, just like any relationship. Um, so um, so that's important. And then um, you, you had asked about my mentors. So, um, I have uh, what I call my Mount Rushmore of mentors that there's four that were very pivotal in my life. Um, and, you know, for instance, uh, Dr. Ira Heilville was somebody that in one of the first companies that I worked with, um, he's somebody that I credit for uh, when I wanted to go to grad school. I had no idea how I was going to how I was going to be able to do it uh, financially or anything. Uh, and he's somebody that really encouraged me to do that, sponsored my start in graduate school. And I'll forever be grateful because he was somebody that was very invested in uh, that phase of my life. Um, and to this day, you know, I I, I still stay connected with them. I um, I, I mean, one of the things that I, I'm all, I always try to show gratitude to those people that really were pivotal in my life, uh, he being one of them, because um, without without his support, I wouldn't be where I'm at today. And I think that's one of the uh, byproducts of good mentorship is mentors will support you in a way where uh, your life and career is ever changed because of the investment that they made in you. Um, and that was such a significant investment uh, for me because he gave me the um, the confidence and the opportunity to do something that I didn't know how I was going to do. Um, and then uh, as I got into my profession, uh, Dr. Kim Heinen was... Uh, a director at one of the companies that I work with. And she really um, showed me how to be a professional behavior analyst. Um, she offered me the opportunity to overlap with her. And I was able to see what a professional behavior analyst did uh, and uh, showed me a lot of a lot of things that I still use to this day. Uh, so I credit her with uh, really teaching me to be a professional behavior analyst and what that means. Um, and then somebody that I continue to work with very closely, uh, his name is Jose Rios. Um, He's somebody that really, and to this day, you know, um, he uh, he opened a lot of doors for me and introduced me to a lot of people. We've, uh, I think, over the last uh, fifteen years, we've um, we've done a lot of uh, state and national presentations together. Uh, he and I were co-authors of the uh, chapter in the multiculturalism book that you referenced. We've uh, done many articles and stuff, and he's somebody that. Uh, not only opens doors for me to work on projects that I probably wouldn't work on on my own, uh, but he also pushes me when I think I'm at my limit. Uh, he's helped expand my capacity because it's like a little bit more. And when I think I can't do it, I end up doing it. And I look back going like, wow, like that. I don't know how I did it, but if it wasn't for him subtly pushing, um, I wouldn't have had that experience. Um, and he's somebody that's really expanded my my scope and my the ability of work and you know there's things that I wouldn't be doing now you know I'm on the board of the Association for Professional Behavior Analysts um, that's an international board little things like that uh, he opened the door for that he's like hey I think you should really join this this board I wouldn't have come up with it on my own but it's a mentor that says I see this potential for you and I think you should do it and has more confidence than you and really guides you in that direction. Uh, and that's really the sign of really good mentorship. Somebody that that believes in you and sometimes more in you than you do yourself that pushes you towards that, that next level. Um, and to me, I'm forever grateful for that. 
Um, and Brett Denovi is my is somebody that I work very closely with, and he uh, from a operational and business side has really supported the uh, entrepreneurship uh, activities that I'm doing now. So, um, so I the, those to me are stand out as just pivotal people in my life that have been key mentors. No, awesome. I and and you know clearly they've inspired you to to reach all the heights that you have. Um, was it one of your mentors who uh, encouraged you to be a co-founder for the Latino Association for Behavior yeah. Analysis? And what's that association really about? What is, how does it how does it serve? Yeah. Um, so uh, so yeah, uh, actually, uh, Jose Rios uh, he was the the visionary of that, and uh, he um, came to myself and one of the other co-founders and just had this vision of you know, starting to really tackle diversity in our field. Um, and this was before 2020, before a lot of the social unrest and all of that really started becoming um, currently more mainstream. Um, and so uh, I think it was back in 2015, we um, we started talking about creating this group to support uh, Latino professionals to have opportunities and to grow. When we took a look at our field, there was a lack of diversity in a lot of the leadership groups, whether it was those, the boards that were leading our national associations or even uh, those that were leading companies uh, and so forth. So we we really wanted to um, provide a space for Latino professionals to uh, to get mentorship and learn and grow and, you know, get inspired to be the future leaders in our field um, and not be left behind. Um, so so we set out to to do that with that mission in mind, and you know we've been doing it ever since. Uh, so we offer a lot of uh, you know mentorship and coaching opportunities. Um, Jose leads a intensive mentorship program for uh, professionals that are looking to grow, um, and you know and what we've seen is um, is those that have been part of this association and have been really active, um, they have really uh, propelled themselves to. Uh, to be leaders and are maybe not only leading companies, but also now involved on a state and national level and supporting our field to grow. Uh, so, so that that's really what we aim for. And you know, we've been doing that ever since. Um, you know, we have monthly webinars uh, that we that we do, um, and you know, we uh, are looking to uh, do more in person events next year to get people you know involved and you know just continuing to support those um, underrepresented groups um, to, you know, have the confidence and the uh, support to uh, become leaders. That's fantastic. And I mean, I, I, and I would be remiss if I didn't ask you to talk a little bit about your, your app. Um, <laughs> <laughs> what Smash my goal. I know you've touched on it a little bit here, but um, I mean, that's, that's incredibly exciting. And, and I don't think that it strikes many people as like, Oh, I go into applied behavioral analysis, and then I end up developing an app. So, what what is what is that like? And can yeah. you tell us a little bit about it? Sure. Uh, well, you know, I you know, I think the the beauty of applied behavior analysis is, is that it's it's got very uh, specific principles uh, that drive behavior in the direction that we want. Uh, whether we believe in it or not, it's there, and the environment is, you know. Uh, influencing our behavior. So with these principles, uh, and in particular, uh, the my mentor and my boss who I work with, Brett, uh, and a colleague, uh, they wrote a book uh, called Behavioral Karma, The Five Laws of Life and Leadership that packages these five principles, which is pinpointing, goal setting, self-monitoring, reporting out, feedback, and reinforcement. Um, uh, and these are the, this is a performance management package that uh, I use a lot in my leadership um, and to run the company. Um, so they're they're really powerful uh, tools to use uh, if one wants to grow and one wants to make progress. So uh, a couple of years ago, I approached them and I said, I, I think this could be an app. You know, your book and the principles could be an app where people could use to track, to pinpoint where they want to go, set goals, self-monitor by tracking their performance, report out to a mentor, uh, and give get visual feedback uh, as well as textual feedback and then tie it into reinforcement. So, you know, we set out to uh, create this app that does that. So um, at its simplest form, you could call it a goal tracking app, but the uh, complexity and sophistication is that you could attach it to a mentor and the mentor could see 
how you're making progress and they could message you, you know, to be like, hey, you're doing good or like, hey, you know, how's it going? Let's keep it going and encouraging you within the app. Um, it's got all kinds of widgets and vis visuals to see how you're progressing towards your goal. Uh, it's got graphic feedback. You could see how you're trending up towards where you want to go. Uh, it gives you little messages of like, hey, you smash your goal. Do you want to level up or do you want to, you know, complete it like you're done? Um, so there's a, a lot of it interactiveness to it. Uh, but for those that are looking to to advance and make progress, progress, which I hope everybody is looking at growing, um, I mean, this is how you do it. And it's a, an intentional and deliberate way of tracking your progress. Um, and I think that's the part that's missing uh, in most people is people have goals and dreams, but the intentionality of actually pinpointing what that is and what they want, uh, setting a goal to it and a time frame to it and measuring it uh, so that way you can move it. Uh, is something that's missing that I hope the the app, which not only is for behavior analysts, but it's all it's for anybody that wants to make improvements. Um, I hope that this is a solution to help them level up. So um, our, our saying in the app is if you can measure it, you can move it. So uh, it's just a matter of taking that leap and starting to measure the things that are important to you. And that self-monitoring process will will propel you to start growing. Yeah. Awesome. I can't wait. In 2024, it's right around the corner. Almost so, there. Almost yeah. there. Yeah. <laughs> Can't wait for it. Awesome. Well, you know, as we are wrapping up, there's one question that I always like to ask, which yeah. is, you know, if you could go back uh, to yourself when you were leaving, when you're about to graduate from Cal State Long Beach and you were going to give yourself one piece of advice, what would it be? Oh, um, that, that's, that's a tough one because I, uh, I'm very grateful for how things have turned out, although there's been many, many, many bumps and bruises along the way. Um, I, I think the biggest thing is, um, I mean, I, I'll wrap it up into a couple of things. Uh, uh, one of them is just to be patient with myself and trust as long as I stay focused, trust that, trust in the process and not put too much pressure on myself to have to be a certain thing in a certain time frame in a certain way. Um, so, because I, I put a lot of pressure on myself, uh, even back back in my Cal State Long Beach days. Um, and, and the other thing that I, I would recommend, um, and, it's, and it's a recommendation that I'm making my kids who are of college age now is uh, to start really thinking about what you want your career to be um, and almost uh, reverse engineer it. Uh, I think a lot of times people might focus on like, oh, this major now, cause it's cool. And then all of a sudden they graduate. It's like, oh, now what do I do? Like, I don't know. I don't know what to do with this major. I, I would almost encourage people to say, what, what do I want to do for a living? What kind of, what kind of life do I want? Um, what kind of career do I want? What, what really resonates with me? What, um, what would inspire me to wake up every day uh, and be as authentic to what really moves you? Um, and, and then reverse engineer it. So based off that, you know, what kind of degree do I need to have to be able to be eligible for that kind of work? Uh, what kind of experiences, what kind of internships can I, can I get and really start uh, off of that visualization, um, being able to start to create a path that leads you there. Um, so I always like to start with the end in mind and then reverse engineer it to how you're going to get there now. Um, and that's one of the things that I wish I was even more intentional about it back then. Um, but the saving grace was that helping people was always the uh, core value of all my decisions. Um, and it's probably what led me to where, what I'm doing now, because I've always wanted to just help people and be of service to people. Um, and that's what I get to do. So. Awesome. Yeah. Well, Isaac, thank you so much for your time. I think that this has been just an incredibly informative chat and it's, you know, great to, great to see your journey. Uh, or hear about your journey. And uh, I think, you know, pretty inspirational. So thank you so much for your time. But um, if for for those of you who are tuning in, also, thank you so much for, for being here. Uh, if you have any questions uh, or want to just follow what we're doing, want to make sure you don't miss the next industry chat, you can follow, you can follow us on any of those social media platforms or find us at www.csuob.edu slash alumni. Uh, but Isaac, if folks wanted to continue the conversation or maybe follow up on some things with you, how might they get in touch with you? Yeah, um, I'm on LinkedIn. So uh, if they go to Isaac L. Bermudez at LinkedIn, uh, they could find me there. Uh, they can message me for whatever they need. Um, you know, I'm 
our company's uh, Brett Denovian Associates, uh, and specifically it's Brett Denovian Associates, California. Uh, so uh, they can go to www.brettdassociates.com and track me down there. Um, also, uh, if people go on YouTube and search Mentorologist, uh, they'll find our YouTube channel with uh, content that is aimed at, you know, at providing mentorship uh, support and content. And then on the uh, iOS and app and Android store, uh, look out early next year for Smash My Goal. And, you know, hopefully people will get a lot of value out of that. Well, thank you so much again, Isaac. And uh, we really appreciate having you today. Thank you. And Thanks for, for having me. Yeah, awesome. And everyone else, see you next time. Thanks. Okay.